Jordan was about to continue his conversation with Darren when his phone rang. What's the issue? Jordan snapped at the caller. Do you need me outside? All right. After ending the call, he cast uncertain glances at both Stella and Darren. Uncle, if you have to handle something, don't let us keep you, Darren remarked casually, sipping his wine. I'll join you in a while, Jordan remarked before leaving. With him gone, only Stella and Darren remained in the private suite. Meanwhile, Amber and Sophia found another vacant room in the hotel. As soon as they entered, Amber helped put Sophia on the bed and jumped onto the couch. She relaxed, pulling out her phone to distract herself, while Lori, watching from a distance, was sure that Amber would regret her casual demeanor later. Sophia scrutinized Amber with evident disapproval. She had never been fond of Maya's two daughters. One had caused uproar in the Brooks family by almost running off with a penniless lover. Thankfully, she was caught and confined to the family's uppermost floor, or the family's reputation would have been tarnished, she thought. Now that Amber was with Darren, her audacity seemed to know no bounds. She even disregarded her elders. Get up, Sophia demanded coldly. Neither Darren nor Greg were present, and Sophia wished she could discipline Amber right there and then. Amber's very presence reminded her of Maya. She had always tried to reason with Maya, but she was always met with anger and insults. Her complaints fell on deaf ears as Greg always sided with Maya. Eventually, after Maya's passing away, Greg wed Shannon. Reflecting on past disagreements with Maya, Sophia's disdain for Amber intensified. She saw Amber as an extension of her mother's defiance, lacking the grace and politeness of Stella. It was no wonder that when Bonnie proposed pairing Stella with Darren, Sophia was wholeheartedly on board. Amber met Sophia's gaze with indifference, making no move to stand. Such an unruly young woman, Sophia fumed. Thanks for the compliment, Amber retorted. It wasn't the first time she'd been accused of lacking manners, but it was usually by Greg. Sophia was actually burning in anger. You've become so arrogant, she yelled. In the Brooks family, her word was often the law, with even Greg hesitating to cross her on certain issues. But it seemed that since Amber was with Darren, she thought she was above reproach. You brought me here, so if you have something to say, just say it, Amber snapped, pausing from texting Darren on her phone. Sophia was faking her illness earlier. Now she was clearly flushed with anger and showed no sign of her alleged sickness. If that's all, I'll be heading back. Amber said, pocketing her phone. She hadn't been away from the private suite for long. If she returned quickly, Stella wouldn't have had a chance to offer Darren that drink. Amber, Bonnie interjected with a sly smile, blocking her path. I have something she wants to discuss with you, she pretended. Discuss? Amber scoffed. Are you trying to convince me to step aside for Stella and Darren? She read her mind. Bonnie chuckled awkwardly at her directness. Amber, Darren hasn't legally tied the knot with you. He's not technically your husband, she pointed out. Amber shot back. Aunt, are you losing your sight and hearing? Didn't you see the affection between Darren and me? Didn't you hear us talk about planning a celebration on the New Year's? She questioned. Amber, what are you talking about? Bonnie feigned confusion, attempting to stall. Darren and I have been intimate, and he plans to marry me. So tell me again how he's not my husband, Amber said with a hint of sarcasm. Disgraceful, Sophia exclaimed with disgust upon hearing Amber's confession. But Amber, long accustomed to her grandmother's disdain, met her gaze unflinchingly. Amber, Bonnie began, offering a smile. Stella is your younger sister. She paused, studying Amber's reaction. She's genuinely fond of Darren. And why are you still pushing this? Amber was surprised. Didn't Darren make his feelings clear at the gathering? He has chosen me. He has no interest in Stella, she repeated. Bonnie persisted. Amber, you just haven't given Stella and Darren the opportunity to connect. Given the chance, Darren would surely come around to Stella. The more she argued, the more convinced she seemed of her own words. Imagine the benefits for you if Stella and Darren got together, she continued. Amber silently cursed. The audacity of Bonnie suggesting that she should step aside was infuriating. 
Aunt, did you take a blow to the head? Amber couldn't contain her sarcasm. She shot a cold glance at Bonnie's increasingly stern face and noticed Lori's watchful gaze from the sidelines. Amber, watch your mouth, Bonnie snapped. Amber retorted, if you were thinking straight, why would you talk like this? Her anger was mounting. Darren's attractive, wealthy, influential, and treats me right. Why in the world would I give such an amazing man to Stella? Bonnie's face reddened with each of her pointed words. Amber, Stella truly cares for Darren. Bonnie tried again. Darren isn't some second-rate choice, Amber fired back. Wake up from your fantasy. The only reason I came to this dinner was out of respect for Uncle Jordan. Don't get any ideas about taking my man. And if you upset him, trust me, you'll regret it. Amber's icy stare fixed on Bonnie. You might want to rethink your little plan, Aunt Bonnie. Or you'll learn the hard way, she warned. The gravity of her words gave Bonnie pause. She'd heard tales of Darren's influence and knew that crossing him might lead to consequences. But Lori, sensing an opportunity to fan the flames, whispered, Aunt, if Stella wins Darren over, it's Amber who stands to lose the most, right? She asked. Bonnie was bolstered by Lori's words and snapped back, Amber, Stella is family. You seem to only think of yourself. Can't you consider her happiness? If Darren chooses Stella, you should gracefully exit the picture and stop clinging to him, she added. Amber's only response was a chilling laugh, dismissing Bonnie's words entirely. Anyone would be a fool to heed her words. Amber, did you even listen to what your aunt just said? Sophia's tone was firm and unyielding. Amber smirked, glancing sidelong at Sophia. If none of you value my opinion, then whatever consequences arise aren't on me. When the time comes and Darren's anger flares and he decides to hold you accountable, don't come running to me, she warned. She took a seat again, her grin widening. And while Stella is charming, she doesn't quite stand in front of me. Acting vulnerable won't get her far with Darren. But I hope she enjoys her dinner with him. Bonnie was fuming at Amber's words, silently affirming her belief that Stella was the crown jewel of their family. To her, Darren would inevitably be smitten with Stella. Seeing Bonnie so adamant against her, Amber could only shake her head in amusement. Did they really think inviting Darren and me to dinner here was a smart move? She thought, noticing Lori trying to hide a smug smile. Amber, Lori began speaking, flashing a disingenuous smile. If Darren becomes infatuated with Stella, maybe you should just head back to the brooks. She tried to provoke Amber. We'll see how that pans out, Amber retorted coolly. If Darren and Stella become close, you'll have no place in the Fleming family, Lori pressed on, a smugness in her voice. In response, Bonnie shot Amber a cold, accusing look, behaving as if Stella and Darren were already together. Lori, remember Stella's your sister too, Amber shot back, her attention turned to Lori. While Stella might not be Darren's type, she certainly fits the bill for someone like Carlos. The Watsons are an influential family, after all. Lori's face clouded over with anger. Anyone could tell that Amber had offended her. Amber looked at Bonnie and probed. Aunt, surely you're not keen on that jerk Carlos, right? Amber, watch your words, Lori snapped back. Her defensiveness made it clear that she feared for Stella, especially around someone as dominant as Carlos. She knew too well that Stella's vulnerability could easily evoke a man's protective instincts. As Lori fumed, she stormed over to Amber, her eyes ablaze. You think you can just talk trash here? I should rip that smart mouth right off your face. She made a move to slap Amber, her hand raised menacingly in the air. But the strike never landed. For a long moment, Lori's hand hovered, uncertainty flashing in her eyes. Try it, Lori, and Darren will make sure you regret it, Amber challenged, her voice dripping with sarcasm. Lori hesitated. Despite her fiery words, she was caught between anger and fear. Don't get cocky, Amber, she spat. Without Darren watching your back, you're nothing. She was visibly frustrated. She wanted to lash out so desperately, but was restrained by the possible consequences. It made her feel impotent. Growing bored of the confrontation, Amber rose to leave. As she did so, Bonnie rushed to block her way. Amber, you promised you'd stay. Rubbing her eyes wearily, Amber replied, 
I'm tired, Aunt Bonnie. I'm going to find Darren so he can take me home. But as she tried to bypass Bonnie, the woman grabbed her arm with a strong grip. For a split second, Amber glanced down at the hand restraining her, then up into Bonnie's defiant eyes. Without warning, she delivered a swift kick to Bonnie's stomach. Dressed in jeans, Amber's kick was forceful, and Bonnie staggered back, winded and shocked. Amber, how could you strike your elder like that? She gasped. Amber met her gaze coolly. I've warned you before. Stay away from Darren. Do you think you can push me around and manipulate Darren? Dream on, she continued. Her voice was harsh. And if you're so set on splitting us up, maybe think about getting Stella out of the house first, she added. One more word, Amber, and I swear I'll shut you up for good. Bonnie's fury redoubled at the implication. Amber cast a sly look at Bonnie, thinking how entertaining it'd be to watch the two of them go head to head. But she had wasted enough time already. If she hovered around any longer, Darren would be upset. As she made her way to the exit, Sophia's voice rose in desperation. Amber, you stop right now! Ignoring Sophia, Amber quickened her pace, prompting Sophia to berate her even louder. You ungrateful wretch! After everything the Brooks family has done for you! But the louder Sophia became, the faster Amber walked, leaving the tumultuous scene behind her. As she made her exit, Sophia, Bonnie, and Lori found themselves rushing after her. They couldn't let Amber interfere with their ongoing scheme. Amber had become more assertive and headstrong in her behavior, living her true self after a long time. She no longer hid behind her meek identity, and even Darren supported her. Reaching the entrance to their private dining room, Amber found the door locked, and faint sounds emanated from within. Exasperated, she thought, who on earth locked this? She was about to kick the door open when Bonnie and the others caught up a smirk on their faces upon hearing the noises from the room. They presumed Darren was with Stella inside. Bonnie couldn't help but think that after tonight, Stella would soon be solidified as Darren's love interest. Their future plans would involve integrating Stella into the prestigious Fleming family, thereby elevating their own status in Michigan. Lori was gloating as well and threw a jibe at Amber. Seems like Mr. Darren couldn't wait Amber shot Lori a sharp look. She was certain that the man behind the locked door wasn't Darren. Lori, with an air of fake concern, turned to Bonnie. We shouldn't let Amber interrupt Mr. Darren's private time, should we? As the tension thickened, a familiar figure emerged from the end of the corridor, a lit cigarette in hand. His eyes found Amber. Amber, he called out, a hint of affection in his voice. Upon recognizing the voice, her face lit up with a radiant smile. Hubby. Darren approached and effortlessly took Amber's hand into his own. What's going on here? He inquired. Everyone except Amber was flabbergasted by Darren's unexpected appearance. If he was here, then who was the man in the room with Stella? For a moment, they were all rooted to the spot, their minds racing. Bonnie, in particular, was shaken to the core. Was her precious Stella with another man? No, that couldn't be right. Maybe this Darren was an imposter. Despite her inner turmoil, Bonnie attempted to force open the metal lock of the dining room, desperate to unveil the mystery man behind the door. Inside the secluded dining room, after Bonnie had sent Jordan on an errand, Stella found herself alone with Darren. She gripped her wine glass tightly, her hands visibly shaking as she poured the drink. She took a deep breath to steady herself. By the end of the evening, she hoped to win over Darren. The mere thought of being close to him caused her cheeks to flush with warmth. She saw no issue in pursuing him, even if it meant coming between him and Amber. Her feelings for Darren were overpowering, consuming her entirely. She believed that as her cousin, Amber would eventually understand. If she could just have this one night with Darren, she'd gladly be his secret lover afterward. For love, Stella was prepared to sacrifice everything. Mr. Darren, she started, snapping back to the moment. Her glass was now filled. She approached him and tried to catch his attention. However, he seemed engrossed in a text conversation with Amber, likely updating her on the ongoing situation. Amber had asked him to wait for her, 
so he sat patiently sipping on his wine. He glanced at Stella, acknowledging her presence without really focusing on her. Stella felt a pang of embarrassment, her rehearsed smile faltering. But, summoning her courage, she addressed him, Mr. Darren, I feel like there's been a misunderstanding. As she spoke, her gaze settled on his face, his handsome features leaving her momentarily breathless. She had never met anyone quite as enchanting as Darren, both in looks and status. From his tender exchanges with Amber, it was clear that Darren was an incredible man. If only she had been the one chosen to join the esteemed Fleming family. The first time I laid eyes on you, I was smitten, she confessed, her emotions bubbling to the surface, causing her eyes to tear up. You are truly the finest man I've ever known, she continued, her voice choked with emotion. I often wish I'd met you before Amber did. Perhaps then I'd be the one you cherished. Pausing to collect herself, she handed her wine glass to Darren. Please have a drink on my behalf as a token of my deep affection for you. From here on, I'll bury my feelings, silently wishing you and Amber all the best. Stella's heartfelt words, spoken with such raw emotion, portrayed her as a deeply wronged individual, yearning for the comfort and understanding of a man. Darren took a sip of his drink, barely acknowledging Stella or the glass she had offered him. Heartbroken and feeling ignored, tears rolled down her cheeks. Mr. Darren, why are you treating me this way? I genuinely care about you, she cried. Drink it, he said in his neutral voice. Mr. Darren, she responded, taken aback. Drink it, he repeated more firmly. Turning to her, he asked accusingly, is there something in this drink? Caught off guard, she hesitated for a moment before vehemently denying it. No, nothing. He gave a mocking laugh. If I couldn't see through a scheme like yours, I'd have been fooled countless times before. His icy glare sent shivers down her spine. Her confidence was quickly waning. She glanced nervously at the wine glass and was clearly conflicted. Is it true then? He pressed on with a menacing tone. Perhaps no one has ever warned you about playing games with me. Stella understood the unspoken threat. The drink had been arranged by Bonnie. She had a rough idea of what would ensue after consuming it. With a mix of defiance and fear, she downed the contents of the glass. Soon after, she felt her body weaken and warmth spread through her. Overwhelmed by the effect of the substance, she started to unbutton her dress, revealing herself to Darren. Darren was unfazed and coldly observed the drug taking its toll on Stella and then stood up, ready to leave. As he headed for the door, a disoriented Stella tried to stop him. Mr. Darren, please don't leave me like this, she pleaded, her state of undress evident. Pausing, he looked back at her, and his voice dripped with disdain. After plotting against me, do you really expect sympathy? His tone was sharp, and his message was clear. Were it not for Amber, I'd have exposed your plan and left you to face the consequences. Without another word, he walked out of the room. Stella felt a pang of regret as she watched his retreating form. Desperate for him not to go, she called out, Mr. Darren, please don't leave me like this. I truly care about you, she murmured, her distress apparent. Darren's intent was to find Amber and bring her back, but as he stepped out, another familiar face approached him. Carlos recognized him instantly. Darren! Carlos said, pausing as his gaze slid past Darren to catch a glimpse of Stella's distressed state inside the room. Her cries, combined with the soft glow of the room's lighting on her skin, elicited a protective response in Carlos. What have you done to Stella? Carlos asked, anger evident in his voice, mistakenly assuming Darren was responsible for her condition. How could you do this, knowing Amber? Darren's patience wore thin. She's not feeling well. Why don't you go in and see for yourself? After all, she's practically family to you. Carlos was infuriated. You're unbelievable, before turning to enter the room and tend to Stella. As he disappeared into the room, Darren, spotting a nearby attendant, handed him some money. After ensuring the room's door was securely closed, Darren retreated, lighting up a cigarette and heading for a secluded place to smoke. Inside the room, as Carlos approached, Stella hardly registered who it was. 
the drug clouding her judgment. Carlos, she said weakly, reaching out for comfort. Seeing her vulnerable state, Carlos struggled with a rush of mixed emotions. Stella's plea, Carlos, please, I feel awful. Coupled with her obvious discomfort, tugged at his heartstrings. Caught up in the moment, he found himself facing a challenging situation. His intentions and willpower were tested. The evening's unexpected turn of events seemed to be spiraling out of control. Carlos, trying to maintain a semblance of control, gently held Stella who seemed to be in a daze and said, Stella, we need to get you to the hospital. His hand found itself on Stella's waist as he tried to help her up. Stella might not have been considered traditionally beautiful, but she had a certain allure about her. Carlos, Stella murmured. Her voice was strained. The disorienting effects of the drug made it hard for her to focus. Her only desire was comfort and a sense of security. She reached out, touching his arm, and as he tried to help her stand, she clung to him. In the process, an unrelated item, perhaps a purse, was accidentally knocked to the floor. Feeling overwhelmed by the situation, Carlos gave in to his emotions. Stella, he whispered before leaning down and kissing her. Caught up in the moment, they both momentarily lost themselves in the haze of the situation. Carlos, who had come with the best intentions to aid Stella, now found himself in a predicament. As reality settled in, Stella realized the gravity of what had just transpired. It wasn't Darren with her. Tears streamed down her face at the realization. Feeling a mix of guilt and confusion, Carlos murmured, Stella, I'm so sorry. Even though he apologized, a part of him felt that the turn of events wasn't entirely his fault. He had genuinely wanted to help her, but the circumstances had spiraled out of control. I'll take care of you, he promised, trying to comfort Stella. But as he spoke, her thoughts wandered to Darren, and the weight of the situation bore down on Carlos. Outside the private room, the atmosphere was tense. People took notice as Darren reappeared. Miss Lori, Darren said, grasping Amber's hand and giving her a pointed look. Lori was taken aback by Darren addressing her. Her confusion grew when she heard his casual remark, Carlos was looking for you. As Darren mentioned Carlos, he glanced at Bonnie, perhaps trying to convey a message. Lori sensed there was more to the situation and tried to decipher the meaning behind his words. Her thoughts were interrupted when Bonnie approached, knocking on the door. Then Amber cryptically mentioned, the man in the room isn't alone. Just as she finished her statement, Lori, in a fit of rage, yanked Bonnie aside. Carlos, what on earth were you thinking? She shouted. From the other side of the door, muffled voices could be heard. A woman's soft murmur, followed by a man's grunt. Lori immediately recognized the sounds and realized that Carlos was in there with Stella. Carlos, you better get out here now, she yelled, her voice echoing down the hallway. Instead of a response, Lori heard more noises from within the room, making her blood boil. Frustrated and seething with anger, she banged her purse against the door. That wretched Stella, she hissed, tempted to barge in and confront the two of them. Darren, trying to maintain some semblance of order, guided Amber away from the unfolding chaos. While Amber didn't say a word to Lori, the irony wasn't lost on her. She once thought Lori came to confront her, but now Lori was the one being humiliated. The scene seemed to last forever, but eventually it quieted down inside the room. Darren motioned to a nearby waiter, signaling for the door to be unlocked. As the door opened, Lori stormed in, with Bonnie and a few others trailing behind. Amber made a move to follow but was stopped by Darren, who shielded her eyes. Inside the room, things were a mess. Carlos and Stella, taken by surprise, were caught in a compromising state. Amber could only shake her head, trying to understand the night's turn of events. Lori stormed in, finding Stella hastily trying to dress. Upon seeing Lori's fiery gaze, a wave of regret washed over Stella. Lori, witnessing Stella in such a state, quickly advanced and yanked Stella's hair. Without any hesitation, she delivered a harsh slap on Stella's cheek. How could you, Stella? Lori seethed. While Stella had been tangled up with Lori's love interest in the private room, her feelings were mixed with confusion and betrayal. 
Initially feeling misunderstood, the slap from Lori pushed her to tears. Lori. Stella tried to articulate through her sobs, a sight that broke Carlos's heart. He might have wronged Lori, but Stella was now involved with him. But Stella's tears only seemed to fuel Lori's anger. She readied another blow, but Bonnie intervened and held her hand. Outside the room, Bonnie had initially been pleased to see Stella and Darren together, thinking the pairing was a success. But her mood quickly shifted upon realizing the extent of the situation, especially after Darren revealed that the man with Stella was none other than Carlos. How had Stella ended up with someone like Carlos, she wondered. She was stunned as Lori unleashed her fury on the door, but the real shock came when Lori laid her hand on Stella. Bonnie snapped back to her senses. How dare you, Lori? She exclaimed, coming between the two women. You should be furious at your daughter. She tried to steal Carlos from me. Lori spat back. Bonnie's voice rose in defense. My Stella wouldn't want your Carlos. I bet he pursued her. We should get the police involved, she declared firmly. Fine by me, Lori replied. Her voice was cold. After what Stella did, I want to see if she can show her face around here again. Her intention was clear. She aimed to tarnish Stella's reputation in retaliation. Upon hearing her harsh words, Stella's eyes welled up with tears. She looked desperately at Darren, who stood at the door, seemingly entertained by the unfolding drama. She knew Darren was aware that his drink had something, yet he let her consume it. Instead of intervening, he had allowed Carlos to enter the room. Why would he do that? Why are you treating me this way, Darren? All I ever did was love you. Stella's voice quivered as she pleaded with him through tear-streaked eyes. Darren's icy gaze met Stella's. He had already let go of Amber's face, allowing her to witness Stella's emotional display. Amber fumed silently, thinking that Stella expected too much from her husband. She wasn't about to let anyone else claim her husband. She was just thankful that Stella hadn't reacted violently toward him. Let's head home, Darren, Amber interjected, preferring a cozy movie night over the escalating drama. He nodded and his smile returned as he looked at Amber. Taking her hand, they headed for the exit. As they left, they encountered Jordan, who had briefly stepped out earlier. The shock was evident on his face, having returned amidst the chaos. We're heading out, Uncle, Darren remarked as they passed by. Jordan, still processing the scene, responded apologetically, I'm truly sorry. He had pieced together the night's events from the loud noises and Bonnie's distressed call. As an elder and host, he had only intended to have a pleasant dinner with Amber and Darren. The intention was to get to know Amber better and express gratitude to Darren, but the evening's twist left him feeling embarrassed and regretful. Back in the private room, the drama continued. Stella's sobs weighed heavily on Carlos's conscience. Feeling responsible, he tried to console Stella, but Lori's anger flared anew at the sight, her hand raised in readiness to strike again. Bonnie was protective of Stella. She intervened by grabbing Lori's hair, stopping her in her tracks. Bonnie's grip was much firmer than Lori had anticipated, causing her to wince in pain. Let go, she shouted. Her voice was strained. Releasing her hold, Bonnie quickly moved to shield Stella. Try laying a hand on Stella again, Lori, Bonnie challenged her. Lori, seething with rage and looking at the strands of her hair on the floor, picked up a glass from the table and hurled it at Bonnie. The glass narrowly missed, whizzing past Bonnie's ear before shattering on the floor. Infuriated, Bonnie lunged at Lori, landing a swift slap across her face. Lori, equally charged, retaliated, and the two women became embroiled in a heated scuffle. Sophia, taken aback by the sudden escalation, tried to intervene, wondering who to assist first. Enough, break it up, she yelled, attempting to separate Bonnie and Lori. In the commotion, a misdirected slap hit Sophia, causing her to recoil in pain. Why on earth would you strike an elderly woman like me? Sophia exclaimed, holding her face. Meanwhile, Stella clung to Carlos, her body shaking from the sobs. Carlos whispered comforting words, trying to soothe her. Jordan, standing at the doorway, surveyed the chaos, his face set in a stern expression. 
He had warned them about setting their sights on Darren, but they didn't pay any heed to his words. Their stubbornness had led them to this mess, and in his opinion, they brought it upon themselves. With a look of disdain, Jordan chose not to intervene. He turned on his heel and left the hotel, letting them deal with their own drama. After the turbulent scene in the private room, Amber and Darren headed home. While the evening's events didn't seem to affect Darren, Amber had a lingering question. Darren, Stella was drugged, wasn't she? She inquired. In her mind, that was the only explanation for Stella's behavior with Carlos. Yes, but she drank it on her own accord, he confirmed. Amber paused, reflecting on the implications. It was originally intended for me, he mused aloud. Amber realized the unsettling truth. Bonnie and Lori had pulled her aside with a sinister plan in mind. They wanted Stella to hand over the drink to Darren. Once he'd consumed it, the drug would create an inevitable moment between Stella and Darren alone in the room. She had naively assumed they were just giving Stella and Darren some alone time. But their plot went awry when Carlos ended up with Stella instead. The unfolding drama between Bonnie and Lori would certainly be quite the spectacle, she thought. Why didn't you drink there? Once drugged, you would have surely been enticed by Stella, she teased Darren. Do you wish I had? Darren quipped back, glancing sideways at Amber. You wouldn't dare, she smirked. He immediately pulled the car to the side of the road. Amber, he said, reaching out and taking her hand. Their fingers entwined and she met his gaze, smiling warmly. I trust you, hubby. Even if Stella tried something, I know you'd wait for me. For some reason, Amber felt a deep trust in Darren. She believed that if he truly loved her, it would be a singular, unwavering love. I love you, she murmured, her gaze fixed on his. He chuckled, clearly charmed. What do I get for resisting temptation? He asked. Amber unbuckled her seatbelt, moving closer and settling into his embrace. As she nestled into his arms, he adjusted to cradle her with a teasing smile on his face. You managed to resist another woman. So I suppose that earns you a special night with me, she said playfully. That's all? He teased with his eyebrows raised. She pretended to pout, prompting him to lean in as his lips brushed her ear. Once isn't nearly enough. She blushed and her heart skipped a beat. Well, what do you propose? She asked. A lifelong commitment? He asked, his tone flirtatious. She laughed, wrapping her arms around his neck. Deal, I'm yours, forever. With that, he leaned in and kissed her. Their passion was evident. Lost in the moment, Amber stopped with a sudden realization. We're still in the car, she whispered laughing. He grinned. Guess we better get home. He fought the impulse to move and glanced at her, who was comfortably seated on his lap. You know, you chose to climb into this spot yourself, he stated. I did, but only to kiss you, she replied with a twinkle in her eye. He chuckled, his fingers softly tracing the contour of her cheek. The dim light in the car made their surroundings even more intimate. Looking deeply into her eyes, he said, You remember we've done it in the car before, right? That memory ignited a warmth within him. The way she had been so boldly passionate, taking the lead, still played vividly in his mind. He had initially assumed her fervor was due to some external influence, but he soon realized she was just naturally fiery, her vivaciousness hidden beneath a meek exterior, and he absolutely loved that side of her. That night's memory was something he cherished. Flushing at his words, Amber playfully scolded him, Darren, we're parked by the side of the road. With a teasing laugh, he gave her back a playful pat, signaling her to move back to her seat. You get me all riled up and then remind me of practicality, he quipped, a smirk playing on his lips. Seeing Amber's flustered face, he couldn't help but grin even wider. Turning the ignition, he pressed down on the accelerator, the car speeding up as they continued their journey. Meanwhile, Lori and Bonnie's confrontation had escalated. Their feud reached such intensity that both ended up with scratched faces, eventually running out of energy. The scene didn't go unnoticed. The chief inspector arrived soon, ushering Lori, Stella, and others to the local police station. Lori still held a grudge against Stella and showed no signs of letting her go.
Shannon got a call from Lori, wherein Lori gave a brief of all the events of the evening. Shannon believed Stella and Carlos were to be blamed for the disastrous event. Upon reaching the police station, Shannon's eyes immediately went to Lori's messed up hair and the clear handprint on her cheek. It pained her to see this sight. Then her gaze shifted to Bonnie, who looked like she'd been through quite a fight as well. What happened here? She mused. Could it be that Amber had confronted both of them? Knowing Bonnie's prowess in a fight, Shannon assumed Amber would be worse among the two. She scanned the area for Amber, but instead, her eyes landed on a tearful Stella who was being consoled by Carlos nearby. Why was Stella with Carlos? As she watched Carlos comforting Stella, a suspicion began to form in Shannon's mind. Mom. Lori, with a bitter expression, shot Carlos and Stella a resentful glare. She seemed eager to confront Stella right there and then, but the imposing presence of Bonnie held her back. She approached Shannon with an aggrieved expression. Lori's voice drew everyone's attention to Shannon's arrival. On seeing Shannon, Bonnie instinctively recoiled. It was a testament to her fear of Shannon's reputation. Mom, where have you been? Aunt Bonnie almost killed me, Lori exclaimed. It was clear to Shannon that Bonnie had indeed attacked Lori. Her suspicions had been accurate. Before Bonnie could defend herself, Stella, with tears streaming down, shakily rose to her feet. Despite being comforted by Carlos, she was clearly in distress. Why was Stella so close to Carlos? Wasn't she infatuated with Darren? These thoughts raced through Shannon's mind, her fists clenched in frustration. Aunt Shannon, I'm so sorry, this is all my fault, Stella sobbed. Lori was fueled by anger and jealousy. She moved to strike Stella, but Carlos swiftly intervened and blocked her attempt. Is that all you want to do? Carlos challenged. Shannon's gaze shifted between Stella and Carlos. The scene struck a chord in her heart. She worried that her daughter's future would be marred by such disputes. In the eyes of many men, Stella's vulnerable demeanor was preferable to Lori's assertiveness. Lori! Shannon called out softly, preventing another outbreak of violence. She then directed her attention towards Carlos. Carlos, remind me once. Who did you marry? Realization dawned on him. He was indeed committed to Lori, not Stella. Overwhelmed by guilt from his actions with Stella, he gravitated toward the sobbing girl, offering comfort. Do you think Lori has no right to be upset after what you've done? Shannon's voice was sharp. Tears were streaming down Stella's face as she stepped forward. Aunt Shannon, Lori, I'm truly sorry. I accept my fault in all of this. Her fragile act only further provoked Lori. She wanted to confront Stella once more, but Shannon held her back. Without the slightest hint, Shannon delivered a stinging slap to Stella's cheek. The sound echoed through the police station, drawing a startled reaction from Bonnie. Stella clutched her reddened face, her sobs intensifying as she continued to plead for Lori and Shannon's forgiveness. Carlos's voice was laced with worry. Why did you do that? He asked Shannon. Carlos... I'll be discussing this with your parents, Shannon responded coolly, escorting Lori away from the scene. The prospect of her discussing the matter with his parents alarmed Carlos. It wasn't his parents that worried him, but rather the influence of his grandfather, David. Shannon quickly ushered Lori to their car amidst the chaos. Lori continued to rant as her voice was filled with rage. I could kill that girl, she yelled. Lori! Shannon's voice was stern. If you lay a hand on her, you'll only push Carlos further away. Shannon couldn't help but think about the constant disagreements surrounding the child that always seemed to irritate Carlos. What on earth happened? Why were Stella and Carlos together? On the call, you didn't tell me anything properly? She asked. Blinded by rage and the scene of Stella and Carlos together, Lori was so focused on her altercation with Bonnie that she hadn't pondered on how Stella and Carlos ended up in that position. It's Amber's doing, it has to be, she declared without hesitation. Lori, Amber isn't your main concern right now. Shannon's eyebrows knitted together. She knew that Amber might have been troublesome, but she was straightforward and had never shown an interest in Carlos. Stella was another story. 
Seemingly meek and trailing behind Lori, Stella was more cunning than they all thought. Shannon was wary that Stella, with her aspirations of a lavish life, would latch on to Carlos, especially after this incident. With Stella's manipulations potentially swaying Carlos, Lori was at a disadvantage. Mom! Lori's voice cracked, pain evident from Bonnie's assault and the emotional sting from Carlos's cold demeanor. What am I supposed to do now? She recognized that she couldn't outmaneuver Stella now. Why would she do this? She said she was into Darren. How did she end up with Carlos? Her voice grew shaky. Lori, you need to stay strong, Shannon urged, trying to console her daughter. A night that started with promise had devolved into a disaster. Stella had always hoped Darren would choose her, but unexpectedly, it was Carlos who had pursued her first. Carlos had quite a bit of influence in society, especially with his parents as strong allies. Bonnie never really cared for Carlos. After all, before Lori, he was engaged to Amber. And now, he seemed to be juggling both Amber and Lori. To Bonnie, Carlos was the type who played both sides, not someone trustworthy. He was nowhere near Darren's league. Not just Bonnie, others too shared this sentiment about Carlos. On the drive home, Carlos dropped off Bonnie, Sophia, and Stella. The atmosphere in the car was thick with tension. Bonnie simply held Stella's hand and chose to remain silent. Stella's thoughts were centered on Darren, making her disinterested in engaging with Carlos. After dropping Stella off, Carlos saw her teary red eyes. I'll come visit you tomorrow, he said. He reached out and caressed her face. There was something captivating about her when she looked up, eyes glistening with tears. Stella merely nodded in response. Her gaze was fixed on him. He watched as Stella, Bonnie, and Sophia made their way inside. His original intent that evening was to meet Amber at the hotel. He had thought that maybe, just maybe, Amber might be feeling down and he could be her shoulder to lean on, perhaps winning her affections. But instead of finding Amber, he had stumbled upon a drugged Stella. Could it have been Darren's doing? The thought of Darren made him grip the steering wheel tighter. Despite his recent closeness with Stella and being married to Lori, his mind kept drifting back to the enchanting Amber. When Stella, Bonnie, and the others arrived home, they found Jordan engrossed in a TV show, lounging on the sofa. He had come home alone after the event, trying not to engage himself in the mess. Bonnie's temper flared upon seeing Jordan so nonchalant. She stormed up to him, where were you? Do you even know what happened to Stella tonight? Jordan looked up. His voice was calm. If you hadn't been so keen on pairing Stella with Darren, she wouldn't have ended up with Carlos tonight. Hearing that, Stella couldn't contain her emotions any longer. She had managed to keep her tears at bay until now. The one she truly wanted was Darren, not Carlos. Overwhelmed with thoughts about her intimate encounter with Carlos, she felt she no longer deserved Darren. She rushed to her room, her sobs echoing through the house. Bonnie shot back at Jordan. What's that supposed to mean? Are you suggesting Stella isn't good enough for Darren? She sank into the sofa, tears flowing. I'm sure Amber is behind this. She must have drugged Stella to keep Darren away, pushing her into Carlos's arms. Amber has ruined Stella's life. How could she do this to her own sister? She asked. Jordan wasn't convinced. I saw what I saw, he retorted. So, you're blaming Stella? She had feelings for Darren, but she didn't act on them. Instead, she ended up with Carlos. Jordan's frustration was evident. You're pushing Stella to interfere in someone else's relationship. Bonnie snapped back. Darren isn't even married. Jordan exhaled, clearly exasperated. I can't deal with this drama between you two. With that, he got up and left the room. Bonnie's tears flowed even more freely at his departure. You just don't understand, do you? Stella only wanted the best for our family, for us to have a better life. In her room, Stella tried to wash away her memories of the evening. As she stood under the shower, flashes of the intimate moments with Carlos played in her mind. Her eyes were filled with fresh tears and her cries echoed in the bathroom. Darren was well aware that the wine was spiked, yet not only did he have her drink it, but he also let Carlos be with her. 
Inviting Carlos in, Darren wanted him to see her vulnerable state. Overwhelmed by her feelings and the effects of the drug, she was devastated. She couldn't understand why Darren, if indifferent or disinterested in her, would willingly let another man take advantage of her situation. In grief, Stella spent the night awake, reflecting on the loss of her innocence and the role Darren played in it. The next morning, she made no effort to hide her red, swollen eyes and drained face and walked right out the door. Bonnie tried to call out to her, but Stella, deep in her thoughts, paid no heed and left. Bonnie watched her leave, feeling a mix of sadness and anger. In her eyes, this was all Amber's doing. If only Amber had relinquished her claim on Darren, Stella wouldn't have fallen into Carlos's hands. Later, Stella hailed a taxi to the Fleming estate. Since discovering her attraction to Darren, she'd often found herself around Darren's office, hoping for a chance encounter. She imagined scenarios where Darren might notice her, even daydreaming about accidentally getting hit by his car just to draw his attention. She tried various ways to cross paths with him, but to no avail. She wasn't even sure what kind of car he drove. Looking up at the Grand Fleming Estate, she marveled at its royalness. Entering the reception, she was struck by its majesty. Whether it was Darren's circle of influence or his wealth, everything intrigued her. Upon her arrival, Darren's assistant, Mark, received a message that certain Miss Brooks was inquiring after Darren. Given Lori's previous visit, he hesitated to take her directly upstairs. Mark was contemplating whether or not to escort Stella to the office. Suddenly, he received a message from Darren. Let her in. He was more aware of people entering his office. Though last night's episode had ended, he was yet to address its consequences. Stella followed the assistant and ascended to the top floor of the building. The grandeur and luxury of the place took her breath away. Upon entering Darren's office, she saw him seated behind his desk, engrossed in his thoughts and a cigarette. At 31, Darren exuded a maturity and charisma that Carlos couldn't match. Stella found herself captivated by him. She thought to herself how wonderful it would be if such a man were hers. Tears welled up in her eyes as she approached him. Mr. Darren, she murmured, her voice shaking. Darren took a drag from his cigarette, giving her a detached look, seemingly unaffected by her emotional state. He wasn't like Carlos easily swayed by a tearful face. Silence lingered before she found the courage to speak. Mr. Darren, I truly have feelings for you. Why did you allow what happened last night? She asked. Darren arched an eyebrow. What do you believe I did to you? His voice held a hint of mockery. Wasn't I the one who was supposed to consume the drug? His words were sharp, causing Stella to blush, echoing her secret hopes. She hesitated as she was searching for words, but he continued in his icy tone. Do you truly believe you're worthy? Stella's heart ached at the disdain evident in his gaze. Tears streamed down her face as she choked out, Why? How am I less than Amber? Why would you let this happen to me? Darren responded evenly, Amber should have told you she's my fiancé. We're getting married on New Year's Day. You claim to care for me. But have you ever considered Amber's feelings? I have, but my feelings for you are stronger. I can't contain them, she countered. So strong that you drug my drink, he shot back with biting sarcasm. I never did such a thing, she sobbed. Then explain the wine you poured for yourself. Darren exhaled smoke. Deep down, he held Stella in contempt. Rising from his chair, he approached her with the cigarette in his hand. As his words sunk in, she was at a loss for words. She raised her gaze to meet his, taking in the sharp features of the man standing before her. Even in this tense moment, his handsome visage managed to draw a weak smile from her. Mr. Darren, she began with a shaky voice, I genuinely love you. I'm willing to be your secret lover without disrupting what you have with Amber. It was a blatant declaration of her willingness to be his clandestine lover, his eyes held nothing but disdain as he regarded her. Wordlessly, he pivoted and stared out the window, leaving Stella feeling more exposed than ever. 
Do you even grasp the repercussions of talking to me like this? His voice was low, almost a growl. Stella's eyes widened in fear, her face losing its color. I just love you so much, she murmured, trying to emphasize the depth of her feelings. However, her love for him seemed inconsequential to Darren. Carlos, he remarked coolly, was just the first gift I presented to you. The implication was clear. He had deliberately orchestrated the events of the previous night. Stella's heart raced. She had suspected as much, but hearing him admit it was another thing altogether. She shook her head in disbelief, struggling to grasp the depths of his malevolence. Mr. Darren, why are you so heartless towards me? She cried. In what way am I any less than Amber? Darren took another drag from his cigarette, the smoke curling around him as he replied dismissively, there's no comparison between you and Amber. And if you dare to interfere with her again, I promise my next move will be far more memorable. Stella had walked into Darren's office with a glimmer of hope, believing he might still have some care for her. But his cold words shattered that hope. He had summoned her, not out of affection, but to issue a stark warning. Mr. Darren, please don't be so harsh, Stella cried, making a desperate move to embrace him. But as she lunged forward, Darren sidestepped, leaving her to stumble and crash to the floor. Her face collided with the hard floor, blood trickling from her nose. Pushing herself up, she cast a tear-filled gaze at the man she so desperately loved. How could he be so cold, she wondered. Already back at his desk, Darren pressed a button on the intercom, signaling for security. Two guards swiftly entered and began to escort Stella out. Her vision blurred with tears and she repeatedly cried out, Mr. Darren, please don't do this. Mark witnessed the scene. Catching his assistant's contemplative sigh, Darren shot him a questioning look. Mark quickly responded with a reassuring smile. Did you take care of the task I assigned you? Darren asked. Yes, sir, Mark confirmed. Within half an hour, all of Michigan will be buzzing with the rumor that the young heir and his fiancée's sister couldn't resist temptation and were spotted together in a private suite, he added. Just the insinuations, no compromising photos, Darren concluded. He took a final drag from his cigarette, exhaling slowly. Next time there will be, he thought. It was clear in Darren's intent that one indiscretion with Carlos was just the beginning for Stella. Until he felt the Brooks family was sufficiently embroiled in scandal, his thirst for revenge wouldn't be quenched. On the other hand, when Stella walked outside the Fleming building, she got a call. Checking, she saw an unknown number. She answered hesitantly. Stella, came the familiar voice of Carlos, tinged with concern. Your aunt mentioned you left early. Where are you? His voice, once comforting, now made Stella scoff internally. Who needed Carlos? She wanted Darren. Meanwhile, the dynamic between Lori and Stella had shifted overnight, turning allies into adversaries. This new rivalry brought a certain satisfaction to Amber. With the two at odds, she could look forward to some peace. At the very least, Lori wouldn't be fixating on her anymore. Amber surmised that Lori, given her fiery temper and stubbornness, would likely have the upper hand in any drama involving Carlos. After all, Lori had little tolerance for any provocation. How could she not best the meek Stella? As for Stella's recent entanglement, Amber didn't feel a shred of pity. After all, hadn't Stella attempted to poach her husband? Did she honestly think Darren was so easily swayed? Amber wondered. In high spirits, Amber disregarded the recent gossip about Carlos's infidelity and headed to the university to study. Word of Carlos and Stella's rendezvous had swept through Michigan like wildfire by morning. And while there weren't any overtly intimate photos, the image of Stella nestled in Carlos's embrace was quite telling. This scandal didn't just shake the Brooks family, the Watsons were also in an uproar. Amber had hoped that the focus of someone like Stella and Lori would shift from her due to the current drama with Stella and Carlos. However, Stella sought her out again. But before Stella could confront her, Amber received a heads up from Darren's assistant, Mark, saying how a tearful young woman was proclaiming her love for Darren. It was evident to Amber that Darren must have given his tacit consent for this call to be made. 
Inform Mr. Darren that Mrs. Fleming is quite fond of him, Amber replied with a knowing smile. There was no need for Mark to relay her words. Darren had already been listening in. Amber's words seemed to brighten his mood and he occasionally flashed a pleased grin. This unexpected shift in demeanor left his longtime assistant puzzled. Since when did Darren become so different? Meanwhile, after failing to connect with Darren, Stella turned her attention to Amber, seeking her out at the university. Being a fellow student, Stella knew Amber's routine well. On most afternoons when she had some downtime, Amber preferred to unwind at a nearby cafe, sipping coffee and delving into a good book. As Stella approached her, Amber was sipping her coffee, lost in thought. It's all because of you, Stella declared, confronting Amber directly. Amber simply glanced up from her book, unperturbed by her claim. Whatever had transpired between Stella and Carlos wasn't her concern. You're the reason for all this mess, Stella continued, tears forming in her eyes. Was it me who spiked your drink, leading you into my husband's arms? Amber retorted coolly. Stella, I've had enough. Leave. I've warned you once about chasing after my husband. What you choose to do with Carlos is none of my concern. Amber mused to herself about Stella's naivete. Did she honestly believe that some love potion in her wine would be enough to sway Darren's affections? To think Darren would be so easily seduced as if he were as impulsive as Carlos, she muttered. Amber, Stella exclaimed, seemingly at a loss for words. It was as if Amber had been the one to wrong her. Watching her tearful display, Amber realized that Stella was indeed a formidable adversary, even more so than Lori. Amber, why did you spike my drink? Suddenly, Stella accused her. Amber looked up sharply, caught off guard by the allegation. While she was processing Stella's words, a figure burst through the cafe door. Upon seeing Stella, the man made his way over with purposeful strides. Amber quickly realized what was happening. Stella had brought Carlos into the mix. She must have shared her version of last night's events, suggesting that Amber and Darren had conspired to drug her. Amber shot Carlos a coy smile as he approached, a stormy look on his face. But at the sight of her grin, his expression softened. Carlos, Amber greeted warmly, even as Stella continued to sob beside her. Upon hearing Amber's voice, Carlos's attention shifted entirely to her, seemingly forgetting Stella's presence. Taken aback, Stella turned and noticed not the anger she expected on his face, but a gentle and soft expression directed at Amber. Amber, Carlos said, his voice tinged with a melancholic tone. Have you forgiven me? Amber's affectionate Carlos seemed to evoke memories of their shared past, touching a deep chord within him. With a playful smirk, she motioned to the still teary Stella. So, Carlos, what brings you here with Stella? She intentionally trailed off, leaving her question open-ended and eliciting a response from Carlos. I was concerned about you after last night's events, so I came to check on you, Carlos hastily explained. Amber chuckled lightly. Why? What could possibly happen to me? Carlos was clearly caught between two conflicting roles. On one hand, he was rushing to be Amber's knight in shining armor, having caught wind of Stella and Lori's plot against her. On the other hand, he had found himself taking advantage of an opportunity with Stella in her vulnerable state. Carlos was about to address Amber in the cafe, but Stella's sobbing intensified. He had come primarily because of Stella's distressing phone call earlier. Carlos, Stella murmured, her eyes red and swollen from crying. She looked both weary and wronged as she sought comfort in his presence. His gaze softened at her distraught state, but then he turned towards Amber. Amber, he began, seeking her attention. Sipping her tea nonchalantly, Amber met his gaze, and a playful smile formed on her lips. What is it, Carlos? she asked. Stella came to me earlier, claiming I drugged her to ensure her position with Darren would be compromised, Amber preempted, her grin widening. Do you believe her tale? She questioned him. Carlos hesitated, thrown off by her forwardness. Stella was pale, realizing her plan was unraveling. She had hoped Carlos would confront Amber on her behalf, but the narrative had shifted entirely. Carlos, Stella started, 
Her voice was shaking. She paused. She was unable to find her next words, but Amber didn't miss a beat. Carlos, why are you here with Stella? I thought better of you, she remarked, a hint of tears forming in her eyes. His heart raced. His long-standing infatuation with Amber clouded his judgment, and seeing her upset stoked the embers of his desire. It's not as it seems, Amber, he protested. He was torn, glancing between the tearful Stella and the upset Amber, unsure of how to proceed. Checking her wristwatch, Amber sighed. I don't have time for this drama. My car will be here soon. Carlos, trust me when I say Darren isn't the least bit interested in Stella, she declared, dabbing at her eyes with a tissue. With a smirk, she met Carlos's gaze one last time. Crying wasn't a difficult task for her anyway. I'll leave you two to sort this out, she said as she stood up and collected her books from the table. And a word of advice, don't always take sides. Stella's patience isn't her strong suit, she added with a smile, directed towards both Carlos and Stella. See you, Stella. Just remember, if you cry too much, you won't be doing your eyes any favors. And honestly, I doubt Darren would find that attractive. Carlos, enjoy your time with her. With that, she swiftly exited the room before either of them could respond. Left in her wake, Stella felt the weight of Amber's biting words. She glanced at Carlos, whose gaze was still fixed on the door Amber had just left. Her tears flowed more freely now. Stella, it's okay, don't cry. Carlos, hearing Stella's soft sobs, turned his attention back to her. Carlos, you believe Amber's story, don't you? Stella asked, her voice quivering. It's Darren who's really been pursuing me. Amber just wanted to use me. She drugged my wine to offer me up to Darren. She approached me before, mentioning how the Flemings have deep pockets and implying that Darren might seek affairs. She wanted us to join forces to keep him loyal. I've never had feelings for Darren, she added, tears streaking her face. If you hadn't shown up, who knows what Darren might have done. Lost in her emotions, she collapsed into his arms. Carlos, from the moment I laid eyes on you, I've been smitten. You were once betrothed to Amber and then became Lori's husband. I never had the courage to express my feelings. All I could do was admire you from afar, she confessed. Men often appreciate flattery, and hearing Stella's longtime affection made Carlos look at her differently. Stella, he murmured, embracing her. I know your heart belongs to Amber. I might not be your first choice, but it hurts when you favor her over me, Stella whispered. You've got it all wrong about Amber, he replied. This situation doesn't involve her or you. Stella's eyes widened in confusion. The night before had been tumultuous, and now, despite her heartfelt confession, Carlos was defending Amber. Before she could voice her thoughts, he continued, It's Lori and her mother. They're the ones plotting to use you to create a rift. He gently reached out to grasp Stella's hand, his voice sincere. Stella, I want to make things right for last night. Make things right? Stella's lips twitched into a wry smile. How was he going to do that? By marrying her and making her join the Watson dynasty. Lori and Shannon were formidable adversaries. She wasn't naive. Carlos, she began, pulling away slightly. I won't come between you and Lori. Let's just pretend last night never happened. Her voice had an edge of finality. The more Stella spoke, the more he became convinced of her genuine nature. He hesitated for a moment. Before, he hadn't truly noticed her beauty or her strength. But after their intimate encounter and seeing how Lori treated her, he felt an urge to stand up for her. Whether Lori approved or not, Stella had become a significant part of his life. Lost in his thoughts, he impulsively pulled her into a close embrace. Stella was intuitive. From the tone of his voice, she sensed that he believed Amber wasn't at fault for last night's events. If she pressed further, she might alienate him. Darren had rejected her, and while Carlos might not have been her first choice, being with him had its benefits. The Watsons were influential in their own right, even if they paled in comparison to the Flemings. Carlos always had a soft spot for mature and understanding women, and Stella seemed to fit the bill. However, their tender moment was rudely interrupted by an all-too-familiar voice. Unbelievable! 
Lori's voice echoed as she stormed into the coffee shop, eyes fixed on the pair locked in an embrace. Her fury seemed palpable. To her, last night's events could have been explained away by Amber's machinations, but what excuse did they have now? In her eyes, Stella had always been a seductress, now angling for Carlos's affections. Now it seemed like he was willingly standing there. Lori was livid. Without hesitation, she grabbed the nearest object and hurled it at Carlos and Stella. As Carlos tried to shake off the shock, Lori was already upon them. With a swift motion, she slapped Stella across the face. How dare you go after my husband, she shouted, grabbing Stella by the hair and shaking her. The once serene atmosphere of the coffee shop was shattered by Lori's outburst. Customers and employees alike turned to stare. Some even began recording the scene on their phones. Carlos, red with embarrassment, attempted to intervene and prevent Lori from attacking Stella further, but she managed to slap him too. Lori's voice was venomous as she warned Carlos, This isn't over. The Watsons will hear about this. Though not particularly favored by the Watson family, Lori was still Carlos's legal wife. The fact that he'd become involved with her own cousin infuriated her. After Lori's departure and the ensuing whispers died down, customers settled back into their routines. However, from a corner booth, a woman wearing a baseball cap observed the scene with a smirk. She was relieved that Amber hadn't ended up with someone like Carlos. He would have brought nothing but trouble. Upon leaving the cafe, the woman, Suzanne, removed her cap. She was familiar with this spot. Today, she'd observed Amber, then Stella and Carlos arriving. Having seen the morning tabloid stories about Carlos and Stella's affair, Suzanne had a feeling today would be eventful. She discreetly phoned the Brooks residence. Inform Miss Brooks that her husband is at a cafe with her sister, she said. She sat on her spot, sipping her coffee as she waited for the fireworks to begin. Sure enough, not long after, Lori stormed in, living up to Suzanne's expectations. After checking on Amber, Suzanne made her way back to her apartment. She sat down with a bowl of instant noodles she'd picked up from the local grocery store. Despite living across the street from the Brooks residence for a couple of weeks, she hadn't spotted the person she'd been hoping to run into. During the night, after witnessing many events in the day, she went to sleep. She was abruptly awakened by the sound of a car horn from below. Swiftly, she jumped out of bed and rushed to the window, not bothering to put on shoes. A car pulled up in front of Mr. Ben's house, which was inside the Brooks mansion. The occupant remained inside as Mr. Ben approached him, engaging in conversation with the unseen individual. Under the dim glow of the streetlight, Suzanne's hands shook and her heart raced. It has to be him, she wondered. She had waited so long, and now he was finally here. Robert had returned to Michigan again and had driven over to have a look at the Brooks Mansion for Suzanne, but with no success. Meanwhile, Suzanne dressed up and rushed downstairs to spot him. As Robert prepared to leave, a sudden uneasy feeling washed over him. He mused about the Brooks family's decline and the fact that Suzanne still hadn't come back from her overseas trip. He sat in the car to leave, and soon the car drove off. Lost in thought, Robert was jolted from his reverie when the car came to a screeching halt, throwing him forward in his seat. The driver, panic evident in his eyes, exclaimed, Sir, I think I hit someone. The headlights illuminated a woman lying motionless in front of the vehicle. As the driver scrambled out to assess the situation, Robert followed suit as concern was evident on his face. The atmosphere in the car felt stifling, and Robert, seeking some respite, rolled down the window and reached for a cigarette from the glove box. The cigarette's ember faintly spread in the interior of the car, while outside, the driver's voice pierced the stillness. Sir, she's passed out. She's... Do we take her to the hospital? Robert didn't respond, instead deeply inhaling from the cigarette. His anxiety grew with each drag, a cycle of tension and relief. Sir, this woman is stunning. Just a tad on the thin side, the driver observed, lifting the unconscious woman slightly. It was Suzanne. The car's headlights illuminated her features, casting half her face into stark relief. Robert's gaze locked onto hers. She was breathtaking. 
reminiscent of the very first time he laid eyes on her. His hand shook, causing the cigarette to tumble onto the car floor. He quickly retrieved it, taking another drag to calm his nerves. The driver, cradling Suzanne, had already opened the car door and placed her inside the car. The scent of the woman beside Robert wafted into his nostrils, penetrating deep into his soul. He refrained from glancing at her and instead fixed his gaze out the car window. His eyes became dry and reddened by the aggressive smoking. The dark interior of the car was only intermittently illuminated by the glow of his cigarette. With a final and fierce drag, he flicked the cigarette out the window. Drive, he commanded in a flat tone. He remained focused forward, too anxious to glance at the woman next to him. After what seemed like an eternity, he ventured to touch her, fingers grazing the fabric of her attire. He felt the texture to be familiar and exhaled deeply. This isn't just a dream, right? He wondered. Meanwhile, Amber was in her pristine white wedding gown and appeared ethereal. The dress accentuated her features, especially her exposed shoulders. On her day off, Darren had spent the day with her, picking out her wedding gown and posing for photos. Hubby, you're late, she chided playfully upon spotting Darren's reflection in the mirror. Earlier in the day, a call had summoned Darren to the office, prompting him to ask Amber to head out to the mall alone. She had selected her dress from the bridal store and had just slipped into it when Darren arrived. After her playful rebuke, she lifted her dress and eagerly moved towards him. However, the trailing gown tripped her up after just a few steps. He swiftly stepped forward and scooped her into his arms. Why the rush? He teased. It was hard enough getting you to commit. Can't let you escape now, Amber responded with a chuckle. Escape? He repeated with amusement, alluding to her playful choice of words. Amber beamed and shifted the topic. Hubby, do you like my wedding dress? She twirled gracefully, showcasing the gown. He couldn't help but marvel at her beauty. Just as he was about to shower her with compliments, something caught his eye, wiping the smile off his face. Amber caught the shift in his expression, and following his gaze realized that she'd forgotten her shoes. Hubby, she exclaimed. Where are your shoes? He asked. The heels are too tall. They're not comfortable, she admitted softly. Put them on, he commanded. Amber nodded and headed towards the shoe rack, only to be wrapped up in Darren's embrace. Cradling her in his arms, he couldn't resist the playful impulse to sweep her off her feet, quite literally. Her laughter bubbled up and her hands encircled his neck. Her eyes were fixated on his face. Hubby, she whispered. He met her gaze and a small smile played on his lips. What is it? He asked. Just wanted to call you that, she chuckled. Her joy was evident. The simple pleasure of being in his arms and addressing him as hubby was enough to make her heart full. Setting her down gently, he placed the heels in front of her. As she extended her leg, the delicate skin of her feet touched his hand. She playfully wiggled her toes and asked, Hubby, could you help me? Without a word, he picked up the shoes and gently slipped them onto her feet. As he knelt before her, Amber was struck by the realization. Here was Darren, the formidable leader of Flemings, humbling himself to help her. This simple act held more meaning for her than even the grandest romantic gestures. Hubby, you're incredible, she murmured. When he looked up, he was met with the unexpected sight of tears in her eyes. Why are you so loving to me? She whispered. She had never known a love like this. In Darren, she had found her one true partner. He playfully tapped her nose and chuckled. Silly girl, you're my wife, he declared, his voice deep and sincere. The weight of his words made her tears flow even more freely. It wasn't like her to cry easily. Suddenly, I'm a crybaby, she joked about herself. He laughed, gently wiping away her tears. She quickly hugged him. With how great you are, there must be so many women trying to steal you away. Like Stella, for instance, she teased. And if there are, he responded, holding her close with a smirk. That's why I have to treat you extra special, she whispered, 
leaning in for a spontaneous kiss. The unexpected show of affection caught him off guard and made him grin. After their lips parted, he pulled her close and returned the favor with a passionate kiss of his own. Men should take the lead in these situations, he said with a hint of mischief. Didn't you like it? She asked, as her cheeks were flushed from the intensity of the kiss. He chuckled. Of course I did. He relished the sensation of her lips on his, the intimacy of their moments together. As the two exchanged glances, ready to share another kiss, Bella's voice suddenly rang out. Amber, how's the wedding dress coming along? Amber was caught off guard and sought refuge in his embrace. She was embarrassed by their intimate moment being interrupted. Bella's eyes widened with a playful shock as she noted Amber's partially exposed shoulder. Darren, she chided gently, be careful, okay? Amber giggled at the awkward situation while Darren shot Bella a glare. Sensing she might have interrupted something, Bella said, I'll give you two some privacy. I'll come back in about 30 minutes. Mom! Darren stood abruptly, quickly straightening out his clothes. What's up? Noting his evident irritation, Bella trod lightly. Yesterday, you and Amber sat down with your dad to prepare the wedding guest list. I thought we could go over it and see if we missed anyone. The Flemings are pretty much covered. As for you, Amber, she said, glancing at Amber before trailing off. Amber knew where Bella was heading. She hadn't invited anyone from the Brooks family, not even her relative, Uncle Jordan. Even Greg was left off the list. Despite her reservations about him, Greg was family, but she couldn't forget how he'd sent her off to the Geller family. After my mom passed shortly after I was born, it was just my sister and me, Amber started, her voice soft. I don't see the point in inviting anyone else. She looked at Darren for support. Darren, squeezing her hand reassuringly, turned to Bella. We'll go with what Amber decides, he said. Bella had anticipated this. Amber, it's okay. From now on, you belong to the Fleming family, she comforted. She knew the pain of coldness from her family and felt a kinship with Amber over their shared experience. Thank you, Mom, Amber murmured gratefully. Once the topic of guests was settled, Bella gave the couple some privacy and left the room. They spent the day selecting a wedding dress and an outfit for the morning ceremonies, followed by an indoor photo shoot in the afternoon. By the time the shoot wrapped up, it was pushing six o'clock. Amber, worn out and aching, slumped onto the sofa. She noticed Darren rise to answer his ringing phone. The caller was Matt, inviting Darren to hang out at his favorite bar that he also owned. However, Darren declined without hesitation. Matt was puzzled and amused as to how Darren had become so wrapped up in his relationship. In his eyes, Darren seemed utterly devoted, almost to a fault. He was about to press Darren further when the call ended abruptly. Who was that? Amber inquired. It was Matt, Darren informed her. Hearing his name, Amber's face crinkled in distaste. That guy. She recalled how she didn't think highly of him. Just ignore him, she advised Darren. I always do, he affirmed and nodded in agreement. But what did he want this time? She pressed. He invited me to dinner at the bar, Darren replied. After listening about it, her eyes lit up at the mention of the bar's name. It was the same bar where she had once gone with Emma. She remembered the exquisite second floor of the establishment and wondered about the unlimited food. You know, maybe you shouldn't brush him off this time, she began, surprising even herself. He's a bit of a ladies' man, but it's not like he forces himself on anyone. And you do need friends, after all. If you keep turning him down, he might stop inviting you. Darren raised an eyebrow, amused at her sudden change of heart. Feeling a bit self-conscious under his gaze, she added, Look, if you're worried about anything happening, I can come with you. After considering for a moment, Darren agreed. All right. Amber's eyes sparkled with barely concealed excitement. The thought of tasting the renowned wine from the bar was tantalizing. Catching on to her eagerness, Darren chuckled and dialed Matt, informing him they'd join him in 30 minutes. On the other end, Matt was puzzled. It wasn't like Darren to go back on his word. Something was definitely up, he thought. Outside the bridal shop, a car had been parked since morning, 
It was keeping an eye on them and only left after Darren and Amber arrived. From inside, a woman observed Darren's exit. The radiant smile on Amber's face stung like a thorn in her heart. She had detailed information about Amber, her family background, interests, and education. Miss Geller, should we still follow them? The driver turned to ask Isabella. Gazing at the picture of Amber, Isabella smiled forcefully. Looking up at the departing car, she said coolly, keep following. For her, knowing both herself and her rival was essential to reclaiming Darren. If she didn't, she risked being shipped off to an unpleasant place by Julie once more. Meanwhile, Darren took Amber to the bar. This marked her second visit to the place. Through Darren, she learned that this establishment was under Matt's domain. Situated in the heart of Michigan, Matt had crafted this haven for his indulgences. She had little respect for his lifestyle, yet the promise of the bar's exceptional wines was the sole reason she'd suggested coming. The duo made their way to the top floor. In stark contrast to the first floor's lively scene, this floor exuded tranquility. But upon entering a private suite, they were met with a lively ambiance. Matt was surrounded by women. He looked up as they entered, barely acknowledging Amber standing behind Darren. Darren, I've saved some special company for you tonight, Matt said with a grin, motioning for one of the women to approach. He cast a pointed look at Amber, intentionally making her uncomfortable. It was peculiar to Matt that Darren, so adamant about declining the invitation before, had suddenly decided to come to the bar. He had instructed his staff to alert him as soon as Darren entered. Receiving the call that Darren had arrived with a woman, Matt instantly deduced it was Amber. Over the last decade, no woman had been seen at Darren's side until now. Matt had assumed Darren had taken a moral high ground, choosing his old friend over his wife. Yet, here was Darren, clearly influenced by his wife's wishes. He was still quite smitten with her, Matt thought. It used to be that I'd spend time with Darren, like in the good old days, he said with a smirk, nudging the woman beside him forward. Darren's expression turned cold, recognizing Matt's underlying motive. Is this your friend Matt? Amber intervened, moving closer to Darren and holding onto his arm as a show of their close bond. Feeling surprised at noticing Amber, Matt remarked, The Lady of the Hour is here too. My apologies for not noticing you sooner. Why'd you bring her along, Darren? Darren ignored the jibe and gently led Amber to the couch. As they settled, Amber's eyes were drawn to the red wine on the table. Amber wanted to join, Darren remarked nonchalantly. Reading between the lines, Matt understood Darren hadn't initially planned on coming, but Amber's wishes must have prevailed. So you're here to keep an eye on Darren? Matt teased. But Amber retorted confidently, don't worry, he won't stray. Her attention returned to the wine with envy evident in her eyes. A toast, she suggested, pouring wine into her glass and raising it to Matt. As their glasses clinked, she said, to a lifetime of good health. This unexpected toast caught Matt off guard. Good health, he pondered. Wasn't he already healthy? Why did her words sound so unusual? Amber sipped the wine and made a face. It wasn't nearly as rich and flavorful as the wine she'd enjoyed at the Flemings. Certainly this wasn't Matt's best offering. This wine leaves a lot to be desired, she commented, a hint of mischief in her voice. Matt, is this the standard here? She asked. Our wine is quite renowned, you know. Taken aback by her boldness, Matt replied defensively. Really? She raised an eyebrow in mock surprise. All right, let's get the finest wine from the cellar for Mr. and Mrs. Fleming, Matt grumbled, clearly irritated. But as he caught Darren's eye, there was an unspoken question there. She's quite the wine connoisseur, isn't she? Darren was well aware of Amber's love for good wine. He figured that her desire for high-quality wine was part of the reason they were at this bar. As long as she didn't overindulge, he had no issue with it. Plus, a slightly tipsy Amber had her charms, he thought. Soon enough, a bottle of cherished Lafitte, which Matt had saved for special occasions, was brought forth. Amber's eyes gleamed with anticipation as the deep red elixir was poured. 
She could barely restrain herself from grabbing the glass the moment it was full. She savored the first sip, then the next. Matt watched in a mix of amusement and regret as Amber downed glass after glass. At this rate, his prized bottle would be emptied in no time. Amber, Darren cautioned, noting her pace, moderation, but after a few glasses, Amber's cheeks were flushed and her gaze turned dreamy. She turned to Darren, her voice soft and playful. Hubby. Watching the scene unfold, Matt couldn't help but think how uncharacteristic this was for Darren. He'd always known him to be firm and resolute, preferring the company of composed women. A tipsy Amber was a departure from Darren's usual type. To Matt's surprise, upon hearing Amber's affectionate reference, Darren seemed to soften. Go ahead and drink, Darren remarked. Matt stared at him, taken aback by the tenderness in his eyes. If she keeps going at this rate, she'll be hammered, Matt commented, swirling his wine. She'll be fine, Darren replied with a reassuring tone. I'm here. Matt was further stunned. The underlying message was clear. Darren was perfectly okay with Amber enjoying herself, even if she got a little tipsy. Thanks, hubby. Grinning from ear to ear after getting Darren's nod of approval, Amber leaned over to plant a swift kiss on his cheek. The simple act made Darren's gaze even warmer, which left Matt in disbelief. When had he ever seen Darren this soft towards anyone? He recalled Isabella once capturing a fragment of Darren's attention, but Amber was clearly on another level. She seemed to be Darren's Achilles heel. Amber was ecstatic. She snagged the remaining wine from the table and joined in with Matt's friends, engaging them in a lively dice game. This left Darren and Matt to converse. Deprived of his usual female company, Matt felt a noticeable void. He was used to the constant attention and the tactile reassurance women offered. Without it, he felt off. Darren, are you sure about pampering her like this? She might just walk all over you, Matt warned. Darren just smiled. And what's wrong with that? He clearly cherished every moment with her. Every time she called him hubby, he felt a warmth that made him acquiesce to nearly anything she desired. Man, you're going to spoil her, Matt said, shaking his head in wonder. Darren chuckled, taking a leisurely sip from his wine glass. The sight of Amber's radiant smile reflected in his eyes confirmed one thing. He adored spoiling her. Catching on to Darren's unspoken thoughts, Matt quipped, Are you afraid Amber might leave you? The insinuation didn't sit well with Darren, and his features hardened in response. You've got quite the age gap. By the time you hit 60, she'll just be in her prime. Still, a catch, while you, not so much. Matt shrugged, not regretting his jest. You worry too much. No one's taking her from me, Darren said with a smirk, his gaze drifting back to Amber. She enjoys the pampering. Indeed, showering Amber with love and affection had become his second nature. Growing tired of Darren's public displays of affection, Matt remarked with a tinge of envy in his voice, You're really rubbing your love life in my face. Without missing a beat, Darren shared, We're tying the knot on New Year's Day. Expect your invite by tomorrow. Matt raised an eyebrow. You came all this way just to announce that, he asked. Exactly. Darren's gaze once again settled on Amber, who was having a merry time. Matt sighed internally. Ever since Darren found love, their bromance seemed to have taken a back seat. And he felt the same about Harry. It was as if everyone around him had found their better halves, leaving him in the dust. That said, Matt consoled himself with the thought that there were perks to being an eternal bachelor. After a while, having indulged in a fair amount of wine, Amber approached Darren, likely needing to use the restroom. Given that they were in Matt's domain, Darren wasn't concerned about her wandering off alone. Go on, he urged. In response, Amber leaned in, planting a quick peck on his cheek before departing. Matt resisted the urge to roll his eyes. Darren and Amber's constant lovey-dovey antics in his presence were almost too much to bear. After Amber exited the room, Matt, sensing she might be gone for a bit, motioned for someone to lower the music. He then took a seat next to Darren. Darren noted Matt's serious demeanor and figured his friend had something pressing on his mind. What's on your mind? He questioned. 
I've got a hypothetical situation for you, Darren. If your first love and your wife both fell into the water, who would you save first? Matt smirked, leaning in slightly. Darren gave Matt a measured look and did not answer immediately. What's your point here? He asked with suspicion in his eyes. Just answer, Matt pressed, already fairly certain he knew Darren's choice. Amber, Darren responded without hesitation. But she can swim, Matt pointed out. Darren knew exactly who Matt was hinting at. Years ago, Darren and his crew had rescued Isabella from a dangerous water situation. That incident had bonded the two, at least for a while. I did my homework, Matt continued. Amber was a champion swimmer in high school, won a competition and everything. Darren knew that any competition Amber entered was for the prize money. Back in the day when money was tight, she'd hustle however she could to make ends meet. So, Matt pressed, who's your choice? With a hint of irritation, Darren answered, Amber, but why? Matt persisted, trying to push Darren's buttons. Amber can handle herself in the water. Shouldn't you save the one who can't? Matt was envious of Darren's good fortune and love and was eager to stir the pot. My commitment is to Amber, Darren replied firmly, leaving no room for further debate. Matt huffed in exasperation. You're cold, man. You two had something real back then. You even almost severed ties with the Fleming family because of her. It's crazy how you've just forgotten all that in a decade. Darren could sense Matt's attempt to rile him up. The past is the past, Matt. Things change. He took a sip of his wine with a cool demeanor. Matt, that's all ancient history. If I went to save her, how do you think Amber would feel? He asked. It didn't matter if Amber was a strong swimmer. His first instinct was always to protect his wife. As for his old flame, there would be others to help her. If he rescued his first love and left Amber out, even if she wasn't physically hurt, he knew she'd feel hurt emotionally. And if Amber was hurting, he'd feel that pain too. So why invite that kind of pain, he thought. Matt saw Darren's unwavering loyalty to Amber and could only shake his head in disbelief. What can I say? You're both ruthless and devoted, he stated. Darren wasn't swayed by others' opinions. He lived by his own principles. Okay, Darren, another hypothetical for you. Matt was unsatisfied with the answers he'd gotten so far and wasn't ready to back down. Why was Darren so different? Most guys would waver, recalling the sweet memories of their first love, often overlooking the steadfastness of their current partner. Why was Darren so steadfast? If Isabella were to come back into your life, what would you do? Matt asked, a teasing edge to his voice. Darren met Matt's gaze, his voice even. Why should it matter if she comes back? A decade had passed. What difference would her return make now? But it might, no one knew. Matt was still asking questions to Darren about Isabella in the bar. She was your first love, Matt said, pressing the point. Your one and only unforgettable first love. His frustration was evident. If Amber heard this, she wouldn't be pleased. Darren's tone was a gentle caution. What he meant was clear. Don't bring up Isabella around him. Though Darren might not dwell on the past, it didn't mean that hearing about Isabella wouldn't affect Amber. However, Matt seemed stuck on the topic of Darren's old love, unable to switch gears. But to Darren, Matt's questions about his previous love seemed pointless. Amber held his heart now. Even if Isabella returned, she wouldn't change that. Matt sighed, feeling a mix of sympathy and frustration. Julie has been rather elusive lately. The Geller family had been severely weakened by their past confrontations with Darren, and their influence had waned. The day after the Geller family mishap, Julie had approached the Fleming residence, hoping for some support from Thomas, given his close ties to the now-deceased husband, Lucas. Julie had hoped Thomas would intercede on the Geller family's behalf. Yet, to her surprise, Thomas had her turned away at the Fleming estate's entrance without even meeting her. And who could blame him? After all, Julie had almost allowed her own vendetta to jeopardize Amber. Why would Thomas then assist the Geller family? With no allies left, and their reputation tarnished by both Bella and Amber, Julie felt cornered, resorting to desperate measures against the Flemings. 
Matt then shared a surprising detail. Just two days after Julie was hospitalized, fueled by her anger towards Bella and Amber, she left her bed, despite her fragile state, to meet an unknown individual. Matt was intensely curious about this mysterious figure. Isabella had vanished for nearly a decade. Where on earth had Julie tracked her down? Originally, Matt had anticipated some drama, waiting for Isabella to resurface and potentially shake Darren's relationship. After witnessing the affection Darren showed for Amber, Matt had prodded him with that question, trying to see if Isabella's return would cause any rifts. But to his surprise, Darren was utterly indifferent to Isabella. Yet Matt still wanted to see if Isabella would confront Darren and if Darren would stand up for her as he once promised. As these thoughts ran through his mind, Matt's mood lightened. He signaled to a woman who was earlier engaged in a game with Amber to come over and keep him company. Darren, you need to date a few more before you know which one's the keeper, Matt remarked, slyly hinting at Darren's quick commitment to Amber. Rushing into marriage isn't always wise, he added. Darren noticed Matt's flirtatious actions with the woman and cautioned him, careful with those words. If Amber hears you, she might just give you a piece of her mind. Just the mention of Amber brought a fond smile to Darren's lips. He didn't see the need to explore other options. He was sure of his choice. Such a firecracker, Matt said, chuckling as he recalled how Amber's friend Emma was equally feisty. That Emma girl in particular was even wilder than Amber. The audacity she displayed by running off with Dylan, which eventually led to a car accident and her subsequent disappearance, was legendary. I've always had a thing for the gentle ones, Matt mused, shifting his focus back to the woman by his side and steering the conversation elsewhere. Darren was well acquainted with Matt's penchant for romance. It seemed like every other day, Matt had a new woman catching his eye. Amidst their banter, the lounge's door suddenly swung open. A frantic man rushed in, exclaiming, Mr. Darren, there's trouble with Madam. Darren's relaxed demeanor vanished instantly. Dropping his drink, he rose swiftly and bolted out the door. Matt's expression shifted in alarm. In his own establishment, something had befallen Amber. Swiftly setting aside the woman he had been entertaining, he made his way out. Amber might have had a drink or two, but she certainly hadn't gone overboard. Instead of heading to the restroom after leaving the private area, she was drawn to the lively vibe emanating from the main floor. She had preferred the energetic ambiance of the ground floor. Watching the youth groove to the music and enjoying themselves, she decided to join in. Her thoughts meandered to Emma. The last time they had hit up the bar, they had a playful stint with Ryan in the main hall. This led to a hilarious moment where Ryan, in his enthusiasm, danced shirtless. Lost in these memories, Amber's concern for Emma grew. Emma had seemingly vanished since the incident a few weeks ago. Attempts to reach out via text remained unanswered. Were it not for Dylan's assurance and the apparent tranquility in the Palmer family, Amber would have feared the worst for Emma. She pondered whether Emma would be present at her New Year's Day wedding. Shaking her head, Amber thought of the risks. Emma and Dylan had bolted from Michigan, and returning might put Emma right back in the clutches of her mother and Arthur. It was a bittersweet realization. Love wasn't always without its challenges. Emma should definitely not tread down her older sister's path. With that thought, Amber's mind shifted to Suzanne. Ever since the split between Emma, Suzanne's whereabouts remained a mystery. Feeling a twinge of sadness, Amber immersed herself amidst the jubilant crowd. As the music transitioned, she danced freely, releasing her worries. Whether or not Emma and Suzanne made it to her wedding was secondary. Their safety and well-being were of utmost importance. Amber had danced energetically for a while and felt a wave of exhaustion. She entertained the idea of dragging Darren onto the floor for a dance. I wonder how the old guy moves to the beat. She looked forward to seeing Darren let loose. She imagined him doing one of those stereotypical, slightly awkward dances. Exiting the crowd, a flush adorned her face from the lively activity. As the music paused and the lights intensified, 
Amber bent down to retrieve a phone she spotted on the ground. Another hand reached for it simultaneously, its rough and weathered skin contrasting starkly with Amber's smooth hand. Looking up, Amber met the gaze of a woman who appeared apologetic. I'm sorry, Amber said. It's okay, the woman responded with a reassuring smile, though she quickly hid her hands behind her, evidently self-conscious of her state. Remembering her own hands, Amber thought, hadn't experienced such wear and tear. She took her leave towards the restroom, missing the subtle shift in the woman's expression. That woman was Isabella. Once Amber had left, Isabella examined her own hands. Even under the changing lights, the signs of hard living were evident. She pondered Julie's words, feeling inferior in comparison to Amber's youthful glow. Men were attracted to physical beauty, after all. To Darren, she represented nothing more than nostalgic feelings and the weight of their shared history. Emerging from the restroom, Amber approached the sink to wash her hands. As she dried her hands, a sudden sensation on her foot made her jump. Glancing down, she spotted a dark shape scuttling away. Panic surged, and she raced out of the restroom, letting out a horrified scream. As she emerged, rats scurried around the entrance. Amber, who prided herself on her courage, found herself uncharacteristically terrified of these small creatures. She sprinted from the bathroom as tears streamed from her eyes. Being Darren's wife made her somewhat of a celebrity at the bar. A regular VIP courtesy of Matt's influence, she attracted the attention of the club's affluent patrons, some of whom had questionable intentions. Matt, the ever-protective friend, had assigned security to ensure Amber's safety. Despite these measures, some pranksters used Amber's greatest fear against her, rats. As she bolted away in terror, Matt's security detail misconstrued her fear for a more significant threat and immediately relayed the situation to Darren. Emerging from his private suite, Darren saw Amber rushing towards him, tears streaming down her face. What happened? He asked, alarmed. She flung herself into his arms, exclaiming, Hubby! Her phobia of rodents stemmed from a childhood incident. When younger, Shannon had locked her in a storage room with a mouse, leading to many nights of her screaming in fear. Despite attempts to confront this fear, including getting a pet rat named Whitey, her attempts only deepened her phobia. She once even passed out trying to touch Whitey. Everyone who knew Amber was aware of this aversion. There were rats, Amber sobbed into Darren's chest. Matt watched the scene from behind Darren and was overcome with laughter. He'd never thought that the audacious woman who once made out with Darren in his car was scared of anything. Darren, Matt chuckled. If she ever gives you trouble, just threaten her with a rat. Darren's eyes shot daggers at Matt. Really, Matt? Now's the time for jokes, he remarked coldly. Your club seems to have a hygiene issue. Maybe a call to the health department is in order. This threat made Matt's playful demeanor evaporate. The mere thought of a health inspection could jeopardize his establishment's reputation. Come on, don't do that, he pleaded. This place is always clean. We've never had a rat issue before. Business inspections are a nightmare. Darren's stern gaze conveyed he wasn't amused by the evening's events. He looked at Amber with concern. Let's head home, he suggested. Matt chimed in, a bit surprised. Leaving already? After all the effort to get you here, you're taking off just like that? He asked. After what just happened here, maybe you should think about closing down early tonight. Darren shot Matt a stern glance. Matt tried to appease him. Come on, bro. Name your price and I'll make it right. It was rare for Matt to address Darren as bro, but even this familial gesture failed to soften Darren's mood. Amber was comforted by Darren's embrace and found her voice again. She turned to Matt and demanded, I'll take two bottles of that red wine we had earlier. She paused, reconsidering. Actually, make it five. Matt's smile froze. He had only ten bottles of that particular wine in his collection. He had already opened two for tonight's gathering. Now Amber was asking for half of what remained. Bring them out, Darren commanded, supporting Amber by his side. Trying to stir the pot, Matt teased, if she keeps drinking like this, she might develop a bit of a habit, don't you think? But Matt had misjudged the situation. Darren wasn't in the mood for jokes. 
five bottles, Darren repeated firmly. Not one less. And with that, Darren escorted Amber out of the bar. Matt watched them leave with a pang of regret in his chest. I have only lost today, he wondered. Darren and Amber headed out to their car. Amber was clutching a bottle of red wine in her hand. Her previous unease from the rat incident was momentarily forgotten as she admired her prize. As he began to drive, Darren glanced over at the elated Amber. You better not drink that in one go, he teased. With a grateful smile, she leaned over and placed a kiss on his cheek. Thanks, hubby. Caught off guard, he chuckled and responded. From now on, no kissing while I'm driving. It's too distracting. She grinned and nodded in agreement. Got it. She turned her attention back to the bottle, reveling in its aroma. Upon reaching the Fleming residence, Darren swiftly exited the car, reaching in to scoop her up in his arms. She tried to grab the bottle of wine, but he stopped her. Uncle Will will get it for us, he assured. She cast a longing glance at the wine before wrapping her arms around his neck, burying her face in his chest. I was so scared earlier, she murmured as she remembered the rat. He rubbed her back soothingly. I know, I'm here now. They made their way inside and he carried her straight to their bedroom. The effects of the evening's drinks were evident on her flushed face, which he found captivating. Drawing circles on his chest, she murmured, Hubby, I promise I'll always keep you safe, he whispered, gazing down at her. She smiled as she felt comforted. She leaned in to kiss him, but he beat her to it, sealing their lips in a tender embrace. Darren had started to feel a warmth that broke the perpetual cycle of solitude in his life. With Amber by his side, his once empty heart was full. Meanwhile, the scenes in Robert's house were quite the contrary. Having brought Suzanne back home, he sat beside her, watching the unconscious figure. A whirlwind of emotions tore through him. His initial elation at finding her was soon overshadowed by resentment. Looking at her familiar face, a sense of frustration bubbled up. He had searched high and low for her, and now that she lay before him, old wounds of anger had reopened. Suzanne had long since regained consciousness, but she lay beside him unconscious. She had orchestrated the entire accidental encounter with Robert, using the car mishap to stage their reunion. Facing him now, she felt unsure of her next move. She held her tongue as she pretended to sleep, even though many words were coming to her mouth. Things about the past, about the agonizing seven years she spent pining for him. She hesitated because she feared revealing the extent of her anguish to Robert. Her love for him was so deep that she didn't want him to see the depth of her despair. A knock interrupted the heavy silence. Robert's assistant entered, addressing him with a formal tone. Sir, what is it, Oliver? Robert replied. His voice was devoid of emotion. He had remained in his room ever since he brought Suzanne back, consumed by thoughts of her. Miss Hazel called. She wishes to speak with you, Oliver said. Robert noticed the phone in his assistant's hand, but instead of taking it, he chose to leave the room to address the call in private. Upon hearing the name Hazel, Suzanne's eyes fluttered open. Was Robert really involved with Hazel? Were they married? Suzanne's mind raced, recalling her childhood days when she and Hazel, the heiress of Mr. Ben's family, were inseparable. Hazel was the daughter of Mr. Ben and Suzanne. Amber and Hazel had grown up together in the Brooks Mansion. Suzanne rose from the bed and approached the window. Her feet were cold against the floor. For seven long years in the penthouse of the Brooks Mansion, her sole glimpse of the outside world had been through windows. After what felt like an eternity, she heard the door creak open. Her body stiffened. She hesitated to turn around. Taking a deep breath, she mustered the courage to face him. Robert! But when their eyes met, the warmth she remembered was replaced by a complex, colder emotion. Stop! Robert's voice was stern. He hadn't forgotten the cunning she'd displayed seven years prior. Suzanne, what gives you the right to use my name? His anger was palpable. He walked towards her and gripped her neck. For the seven agonizing years, he blamed her. 
If not for her actions, he wouldn't have been disabled. And to add insult to injury, Suzanne had left him behind, marrying someone from abroad. He thought bitterly. How could someone like him, in his current state, ever be deemed worthy of the Brooks family's heiress? Fear flashed in Suzanne's eyes. She had naively hoped for a warm reunion, never imagining his grip might threaten her very life. Had his love for her truly vanished? Or after all these years had Hazel claimed his heart, always having been right there beside him? She wondered. Seeing her tearful gaze only fueled his rage. He was overwhelmed by the urge to snuff out her life then and there. His mind screamed at the injustice of it all. If not for her and her family, he wouldn't be in this wretched state. Blinded by fury and resentment, he released his grip, shoving Suzanne away. She stumbled backward, crashing to the floor. Weakened from years of confinement and medication, the impact was more than she could bear. Robert! Her voice wavered as tears streamed down her face. She had fought hard to escape the Brooks family, only and only to find him. But the man before her wasn't the loving Robert she once knew. Seven long years had changed them both, and their relationship seemed irretrievably lost. Don't say my name, he snapped. His voice was filled with bitterness. You've done nothing but make me despise you. His gaze fell upon her teary eyes, shimmering like jewels. A pang of pain gripped his heart, and he took a determined step toward her. But with each step, the sharp pain in his feet was a stark reminder of the Brooks family's treachery and Suzanne's perceived betrayal. Would he even be in this condition if not for his youthful, blind love for her? The past seven years had been an endless nightmare, filled with torment and near-death experiences. I loathe you, he spat out coldly. In her mind, she had imagined countless scenarios of their reunion, where he would embrace her, forgiving even Greg for the wedge he drove between them. She'd never envisioned this cold, bitter reception. Robert, I'm finally here, she whispered, fighting back sobs as her eyes fell on his injured feet. He took a hesitant step closer. Even though it was just a small move, she could see the discomfort he felt. Your feet, she whispered. He bent down. His face was inches away from hers. Just as he seemed about to brush her tears away, he forcefully held her chin. My feet, he laughed bitterly. They were ruined by your father. His smile was cold, and it sent chills down her spine. Where was the Robert she once knew? This man with his icy smile was a stranger to her. Suzanne's thoughts swirled, trying to grasp her new reality. She touched her own face. I'm broken inside. This is what the Brooks family did to me, she uttered. A memory sparked in her mind, and despite her pain, she demanded, The downfall of the Brooks company, that was your doing, wasn't it? She asked. Over the years, the Brooks enterprise has faced significant struggles. Without an invisible figure manipulating the events, it wouldn't have collapsed as it did. Robert didn't hesitate. Yes, he admitted. Without the Brooks' downfall, would you even be here? His laughter was cold. He assumed Suzanne had sought him out, driven by desperation as her family's legacy crumbled. Seeing the raw bitterness in his eyes, she felt a heart-wrenching sorrow. The man she remembered seemed so distant now. You despise me, she whispered. Finding you, maybe it was a mistake. After seven relentless years of searching, the reunion seemed to lose its meaning. If this was the disdain she'd receive, maybe she was better off back in her solitude. His fingers gently traced her face, while his tone was contradictory to his touch. What do you mean it's meaningless? He smirked. This is quite meaningful. His words were light, almost playful, but they were laced with a bitterness she couldn't ignore. As he rose, his laughter was hollow. Robert was torn. He had plotted and planned for their reunion for so long, but now he was at a loss. What should he do with her, he wondered. Yet he was clear on one thing. The pain of the past seven years needed to be shared. Suzanne slowly stood up, meeting his gaze with eyes full of sorrow but devoid of tears. She moved to the door, but before she could grasp the handle, Robert was there, his grip firm on her wrist. 
Where do you think you're going? He asked. You loathe me, she replied. Her voice was void of emotion. You're staying right here, he commanded, pushing her back inside. He quickly exited, but not before hurling back a final thought. All the suffering I faced was because of you. You can't just walk away. If you leave, who will bear the weight of my vengeance? How will I find peace? She stared intently at the now-closed door, the deafening silence of the room wrapping around her. After enduring seven years of isolation, she had developed a habit of seeking refuge in corners. Robert had blamed her for all his pain and suffering, but who was responsible for the agony she'd experienced over those same seven years? Her mind raced, threatening to overwhelm her, Memories of the techniques Harry taught her flashed in her mind, and she took a deep breath, desperately trying to ground herself. She couldn't lose her sanity. Not again. Elsewhere, wedding preparations for the Fleming family were underway. After Amber and Darren had their wedding photo shoot, Amber took some time as she wanted to hand-deliver the invitation to the Watson family. She wanted to invite David to the wedding as she still held him in respect. As Amber rang the doorbell, she waited patiently for someone to answer. A familiar servant approached and opened the door. Recognizing Amber from her previous visits, he remarked, Miss Amber, sir, and madam are hosting some guests right now. In the past, Amber frequently visited the Watson household, so the servant assumed she was there to see Carlos or someone else she was close to. No, Amber replied with a smile. I'm here to deliver an invitation to Mr. David. She playfully waved the invite for emphasis. The servant allowed her to enter. The vibrant red hue of the invitation gleamed under the sunlight as she made her way in. It immediately caught the eye of Greg, beside whom stood Shannon. Both appeared surprised to see Amber, but what truly caught their attention was the invitation she held in her hand. What could it be? They wondered. 